I'm very pleased to welcome Max Boot to Politics and Prose. Boot is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a renowned military historian. He is a regular contributor to the New York Times, Foreign Policy, the LA T- and the LA Times, as well as other publications. His previous books include The Savage Wars of Peace, Small Wars and the Rise of American Power, and Invisible Armies, an epic history of guerrilla warfare from ancient times to the present. In his latest book, The Road Not Taken, Boot chronicles the life of Edward Lansdale, the roguish covert operative who remains a deeply misunderstood figure to this day. Boot acknowledges the black and white premise of Lansdale's skeptics and proponents, as well as adds new facts to the narrative from previously classified documents, hidden letters, and interviews. By writing about Lansdale's actions during the Vietnam War, Boot illuminates the parallels between foreign policy then and now, overshadowed by war and not viewing others complexly. General David Petraeus writes, The road not taken not only tells Edward Lansdale's story with novelistic verve, but also situates it wonderfully in the context of his tumultuous experience and offers important lessons for the present day. Now please join me in welcoming Max Boot. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's tremendous to see this, all of you coming out on this uh, Sunday afternoon. I assume you're not Minnesota Vikings fans. You can afford to miss that game, but you are book fans, and that's great to see, and it's great to see uh, a a wonderful independent bookstore like this flourishing, even amid amid, uh, all the turmoil in the uh, the book-selling industry. Well, I'm here to talk to you today about my book, as you might have surmised, The Road Not Taken, and obviously I I made a little boo-boo because I did not, have the f- did not have the foresight to call it Fire and Fury. If only I had done that, I would have had <laughs> an instant number one bestseller on my hands. Well, the subject of my book is, is this gentleman, Major General Edward Lansdale, who, I, a- as was previously alluded to, I think is one of the most mysterious and misunderstood figures in the history of American, modern American foreign policy. He was set to be the model uh, for both the quiet American and the ugly American. He was written about by all of the leading authors on the Vietnam War, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. If you go online, you will very quickly find there is also a burgeoning conspiracy industry around Ed Lansdale, which fingers him as the mastermind of the Kennedy assassination. So if you believe what you read online, and I would not advise you to believe what you read online, this supposedly is a picture, this was a picture on November 22, 1963 in Dallas, and this supposedly is Ed Lansdale from the back, and these tramps being led away by the police are not really tramps, but conspirators who were involved in the Kennedy assassination. This is, by, as you might judge from my tone, absurd, but it was actually the basis of the movie JFK by Oliver Stone, so this has actually gotten a lot of traction online and elsewhere. General Brute Krulak had this to say about Ed Lansdale. He said, there are few individuals in my knowledge more damned at the same time applauded. History is going to have to portray Lansdale's real part. Well, that's my cue. I am here in the service of history to portray Lansdale's real part. So who was Edward Gary Lansdale? He was not to the manor born. He was not part of some kind of Eastern establishment. Uh, he did not go to an Ivy League school and work on, on, on Wall Street like so many of the so-called wise men who crafted American foreign policy after World War II. He was from a much more modest upbringing. His father, Harry right there, and that's Ed, by the way, as a, as a, very, as a young boy, uh, his father was an automotive executive in the early days of the automobile industry, and he had a very up-and-down career. If you look at the list of his employers, quite a few of them no longer exist, and so he was often going bust and sometimes having periods of, of being fairly well-to-do. Uh, Ed Lansdale was born in 1908 in Detroit, uh, lived for a couple of years in Bronxville in New York, but spent most of his childhood in California, and that was very important to his upbringing because he really kind of was imbued with the spirit of informality that we think of as being a quintessentially Californian. He was somebody who resisted wearing neckties and hated regimentation and, and, and long, uh, boring meetings. He was kind of a proto-Silicon Valley kind of guy decades before you had Silicon Valley arise. A couple of other things worth noting about his background. One is that although he was not a great student, he loved reading about the Founding Fathers. He was enamored of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And those were the ideals that would really animate him throughout his life and would 
would be his guiding philosophy as he was trying to represent American interests in Asia. The other thing worth noting is that Ed Lansdale grew up at a time of terrible racial prejudice in the United States in the 1910s and 20s. Of course, given some of the comments we hear today from our own president, I can't say that the era of racial prejudice is entirely over, but it was much more uh, severe in the 20s, and, it was, and, and there was uh, very deep-seated anti-Asian uh, prejudice in particular in California where Ed Lansdale grew up. But he was never infected with that, with that kind of racial animus. Uh, he always treated everybody as a human being, and this really became part of the secret of his success. And part of that, I think, was due to the fact that his family were Christian scientists, and so that was a very small, still is a very small religion. At the time, it was often vilified, and so even though uh, he was, you know, white and, and middle class, he still had some association or some identification with people who were minorities because his family were, in fact, religious, if not ethnic, minorities. So that's, that's a, a, a quick uh, take on his childhood. He went to uh, UCLA, dropped out a few credits shy of graduating, and moved to New York at the height of the Great Depression, hoping to become, like many a young man, a New Yorker cartoonist or writer or playwright. Didn't quite work out. And so, like many other frustrated ty creative types, he went into advertising and became an advertising copywriter in California and had a pretty successful career going when the entire world changed for him and everybody else on December 7th, 1941. This was his, uh, one of his, one of the ads that he did in, in his capacity as, a, as an ad man in San Francisco. Well, as soon as, as World War II broke out, he wanted to get into the fight, but he had trouble doing that because he was a little old to be uh, an army recruit and he had some medical issues. And so he went into the OSS, America's first civilian intelligence agency. And he was not sent abroad. He, was, he did not infiltrate behind enemy lines. He spent World War II uh, largely stateside interviewing travelers who had information about the lands where Allied troops would shortly be landing. And he proved himself to be a very good listener, Lansdale the listener. And that was really the secret of his subsequent success as a counterinsurgent. In 1945, in the, in the fall of 1945, just as millions of GIs were preparing to come home with the end of World War II, Ed Lansdale shipped out on his first permanent overseas assignment to the Philippines. And this was really his introduction to the realm of nation building and counterinsurgency. He did things like going around some of the newly liberated Japanese islands, surveying them in an almost anthropological fashion. He was fascinated by everything that was going on in the Philippines, including this new communist insurgency. There were communist insurgencies breaking out all over uh, Asia, and including one in, in the Philippines known as the Hook Rebellion. That's H-U-K. And here is Ed Lansdale in the late 40s right there. There's Lansdale with some captured hooks right there. And he was really fascinated, fascinated by all aspects of Filipino society. He wanted to learn about their myths, about their music, about their culture, about their folkways. All of this was of endless fascination to him. And so he immersed himself in Filipino society. Now, by that point, Ed Lansdale was already married. In 1933, he had married this woman, Helen, a, a, uh, a, a girl from a small town in upstate New York. They met when uh, they were both living in New York at the height of the De Great Depression. And as I discovered in my research, they both they had family reasons to come together because in both of their cases, their mothers uh, wound up being deserted by their fathers, something that, that previous biographers had not known. But so they, they married and had a couple of kids, uh, and that was this, his family situation when he went out to the Philippines in 1945. Now, in, when, he, when he moved to the Philippines in 1945, he met this woman, Pat Kelly, who was a Filipino war widow. Her last name comes from her late husband, who was of Irish-Filipino ancestry. And Pat was a very unusual woman in, in the Philippines of the 1940s. She was an independent single mother. She worked she was a journalist. Eventually, she had a long career working for the U.S. Information Agency in Manila. She was a very strong, vivacious personality. And she, uh, she was of immediate interest to Ed Lansdale for a number of reasons, not least of which was the fact that she was from the same part of Luzon Island where the Hooks were from. And so she became his guide, taking him into the, into the boondocks, into the back country of the Philippines, on often very dangerous expeditions to meet with the Hooks because he wanted to find out what were they all about, what were their grievances. He wanted to talk to these peasants and really learn about their lives. 
And as they made these, these dangerous and daring trips, a friendship uh, began, and then pretty soon a romance blossomed. And Pat Kelly wound up being the great love of Ed Lansdale's life. And very, very important to him uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, not just personal, but also professional, because she was really a guide to the Philippines, and not just a geographic guide, but a cultural guide. She was somebody who interpreted Filipino culture for him and allowed him to immerse himself in this foreign country in a way that's very hard for outsiders to do. Well, I got very lucky in the course of my book research because I learned an awful lot about uh, Ed Lansdale and Pat Kelly, far more than anybody else has ever known because of what you see on the screen, which are the love letters that Pat and Ed exchanged over the course of many, many years, which no previous uh, historian has ever seen. And I got very lucky because I actually tracked down uh, Pat Lansdale's grandchildren, some of whom live right here in Northern Virginia, and I contacted them and said, hey, you know, I'm doing this book about Ed Lansdale. Would you have any information to share? And they said, hey, would you be interested in these letters? <laughs> would I? This is like a biographical gold mine. And I was, uh, I was doubly lucky because at the same time that Pat Kelly's descendants were sharing with me their, their hidden love letters, uh, uh, the, the children that Ed and Helen had together, uh, uh, Ed and Pete, who are still very much around in New York and in Florida, they shared with me the letters that Ed wrote to their mother. And so I am actually the first person, I think, after Ed Lansdale himself, who has led, read both sets of letters written to the mistress and to the wife, <coughs> often simultaneously. And I might add, by the way, that at least initially, the letters to the wife were more informative than the letters to the mistress, because as you might imagine, the letters to Pat, at least initially, tended to be of the heavy breathing variety, uh, focused on how much Ed loved Pat, whereas the letters to Helen tended to be of the more factual variety, just describing his job and what was around him. And that was, in many ways, uh, more, more interesting for me. And of course, the way relationships tend to work about after 10 years of these letters, the letters to Pat Kelly also turned more informative about what was going on around him. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a knuckle-dragging military historian, so I'm not used to writing about romance. But this actually turned out to be one of the most unexpected and interesting parts of this book. And, it, it, you know, there were some awkward times, to be sure, including, for example, in 1947 when Helen and their two kids moved to Manila uh, to spend a year with Ed at the same time that he was still very much seeing Pat Kelly. Uh, as, as my teenage daughter would say, ox, as in awkward, <laughs> awkward situation. Uh, Ed wound up asking uh, Helen for a divorce. She refused. This was a time when it was very hard to get a contested divorce, so he, he didn't pursue it. And, and they stayed married, but he also maintained his relationship with, with Pat Kelly. And, uh, spent you know much of the next decade or more in Asia, not with his family, and so Helen actually was a very strong woman, and 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 raised their kids largely by himself uh, while he was off serving the country. And at the same time, he did have this 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 uh, very uh, passionate relationship uh, with Pat Kelly. Now, all of this set the scene for his greatest triumph, and and and, and the making of the Lansdale legend in the Philippines, which came about in beginning in 1950 at a very dark time uh, in the Cold War. This was right after the fall of China to the communists. This was right after the Soviet Union had acquired its atomic bomb and right after the uh, North Korean invasion of South Korea in June of 1950. And so there was this widespread gloom and doom in this town, this fear that we were losing the Cold War, that the red tide, quote unquote, was taking over Asia. And there was concern not least about uh, but not least about uh, the Philippines, where this man, Louis Tarouk, was le leading his hooks and appeared to be on the verge of becoming the next communist leader to take over a major Asian country. But this was, you know, in the 1950, after the Korean War started, there weren't a lot of troops to spare. And, you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff actually came up with some plans to send, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops to the Philippines. Those were never implemented. And so the decision was made, let's hold off on the troops, let's instead sent Ed Lansdale, who at that point was a colonel in, uh, in the Air Force, uh, working for a super secret spy agency called OPC, the Office of Policy Coordination, which eventually would be folded into the CIA. And so he was dispatched uh, to the Philippines again uh, with a handful of associates in 1950, and his basic mission was defeat the Hook Rebellion. Here he is in uh, the early 50s in his bungalow in Manila. There's Ed at the head of the table. 
This is actually Robert Chaplin of The New Yorker, who was a good friend of his, his eccentric deputy, Bo Bohannon, and some Filipinos that he was working with. And this was typical of the way that Ed Lansdale operated. He hated protocol. He hated regimentation. He liked this kind of freewheeling coffee clutches that he had in his, in his bungalow where people would sit around the table and shoot the breeze, and out of this very informal atmosphere would arise the ideas that would defeat the hooks. Now, the most important thing that he did in defeating the Hook Rebellion was in meeting and befriending this man, Ramon Magsaysay, who in 1950 was a very young, former Philippine senator who had just been appointed defense minister, a former guerrilla fighter against the Japanese. He was known to be uh, incorruptible and a reformer, but he didn't really know what to do. He was also very inexperienced. And that was the, uh, the gap that Ed Lansdale filled for him. He became his advisor. And they became very close. They became, in fact, as close as brothers. They were even roommates for a time. And they would go around together touring uh, the Philippine countryside. And together, Ed Lansdale and Ramon Magsay Sai really reinvented, or reinvented is the wrong word, really invented counterinsurgency, what we would today call population-centric counterinsurgency. Because the basic insight that Ed Lansdale had was that the Philippine army was making a big, big mistake by using too much force to try to crush the hooks, that they were bombarding barrios with artillery. They were, uh, you know, having these big unit operations, and it was uh, creating more enemies than they were eliminating. So the doctrine that Ed Lansdale pioneered, which today is kind of conventional wisdom in the armed forces, but was very new in the early 1950s, his doctrine was basically teaching the army to act as brothers to the people. He said, embrace the people, befriend the people, win the trust of the people. And if you do that, they will rat out the insurgents in your midst. That was the message that he and Ramon Magsay Sai turned into the doctrine of the Philippine army in battling these insurgents. Now, there were other aspects of, of the Ed Lansdale strategy, because remember, he was an ad man, and so he loved psychological operations, which is kind of the military version of advertising. And he knew about Filipino myths, and he knew that there was this myth about these aswang, these vampires that were said to haunt the Philippine countryside. And so he decided to throw the fear of the supernatural into the hooks uh, to make them think that these aswang, these vampires, were hunting the hooks, uh, which he did uh, with the aid of the Philippine army who took a, a dead hook and punctured a couple of holes in his neck uh, and then spread the rumor that he had been killed by the aswang. And this became an early part of the Lansdale legend. You know, people at the CIA would say, can you believe what this guy Lansdale is doing? And this was, this was part of what he was doing. Uh, but I don't want to give you the impression that he defeated the Hook Rebellion through these kinds of psyops, dirty tricks types of things. He really did it by focusing on the politics of the situation because he understood that the Hook slogan was bombs, not ballots, because the hooks understood at that time as did everybody in the Philippines that the elections were rigged, they were fixed, that this oligarchy controlled the Filipino political process, so you were never going to get political change at the ballot box. And Lansdale understood that he had to reverse that slogan to convince the ordinary people of the Philippines they could actually change their lives at the ballot box. And so he enlisted Filipino civic organizations to safeguard the vote to make sure that there would be no voter fraud. And then, as his kind of crowning moment, in 1953, he appointed himself de facto campaign manager of the Ramon Magsay Sai for President Committee. And, uh, you know, I, I had the good fortune, thanks to the recently declassified documents, to read the report that he wrote after the 1953 election, this top secret report only recently declassified, that he wrote to Alan Dulles. And so if any of you are interested in winning an election in the third world, and for all I know, maybe some of you are, uh, I would recommend uh, reading that report because it's all right there, everything that he did, including uh, writing a campaign jingle for, for Mog Sai Sai, writing his campaign slogan, Mog Sai Sai is my guy, and Mog Sai Sai became known as the guy because of that throughout the Philippines. So Ed Lansdale was, on behalf of the CIA at this point, was this covert campaign manager, and that resulted in this event, which was uh, Mog Sai Sai's inauguration at the end of 1953. And that was really the event that defeated the Hook Rebellion. Luis Taruk sur surrendered shortly thereafter. The Hooks realized that with this popular reformer who had won a genuine landslide victory in office, uh, that they had, that there was no more rationale for, for waging war against the government. Now they could, 
they could have their, their grievances addressed through the political process. That ended the Hook Rebellion, and it made Ed Lansdale a, a very popular guy in Washington. And here he, there's Ed Lansdale with CIA Director Alan Dulles, and he became very quickly a favorite of Alan Dulles. This was really one of the great unsung American victories in the Cold War, still very little known, but it was a tremendous triumph, and it had been achieved without any American combat troops. No Americans had to go in and combat. All you had to do was, said Ed Lads was to send Ed, Ladsdale, Ed Lansdale uh, to the Philippines, and he got the job done. He even got a new nickname. He became known as, as Colonel Landslide, or uh, Landslide Lansdale, after Magsai Sai's uh, thumping victory in, in the presidential election. So it was natural, given the growing reputation that, uh, that Lansdale had in Washington at that time, that people thought of Lansdale when they were dealing with another problem in another Southeast Asian country. What was going on in 1954? Well, that was the year when uh, the French garrison at Dien Bien Phu was being defeated. And this, by the way, was a picture I took at the, at the very interesting museum that now sits in Dien Bien Phu. Uh, that led to the Geneva Convention and the partition of Vietnam. You had Northern Vietnam, which was under Ho Chi Minh and the, and the Viet Minh, essentially under the communists. Then you had South Vietnam, which was supposed to be a non-communist state, but nobody knew how could you create this new state in South Vietnam that would be a viable concern. This, how could it, how could it su succeed? And so when, when they were thinking in Washington about what do you do about this, it was pretty natural that Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, who really ran American foreign policy, they decided, let's send Ed Lansdale. He knows what to do. He'll figure it out. And so Ed Lansdale in 1954, in the summer of 1954, was dispatched to Saigon with the marching orders being, do what you did in the Philippines. And he did, more or less. The first thing he did was to find a new leader uh, to whom he could attach himself and whom he could guide in a way that he thought would be helpful. And that leader was this man, No Din Ziem, this uh, Catholic Mandarin who had been a minister under the French before quitting in disgust and who opposed both the, the colonialist and the communist and therefore had some credibility as a Vietnamese nationalist and was appointed prime minister in the summer of, so of South Vietnam in the summer of 1954. But at that point, very few people imagined that he would last uh, nine weeks, much less nine years, because he was facing such enormous difficulties that nobody thought he would actually be able to consolidate authority. And the French, for example, were eager to, as eager to oust him as the communists were. Well, enter Ed Lansdale. And Ed Lansdale immediately began cultivating ZM here. That's Ed Lansdale and some other advisors. And how did he do it? Well, he used his patented methodology, which is very dead simple to state, very hard to implement, which was that Ed Lansdale listened. He did not lecture, he listened. And that was not easy to do with somebody like No Din Ziem, who became known for his, notorious really, for his hours-long monologues that would bore other Americans to tears. Uh, most Americans, and confronted, you know, listening to Ziem drone on hour after hour about the minutiae of South Vietnamese politics, would be ready to strangle themselves, or at least to leave the, the office. Ed Lansdale was made of sterner stuff, and he probably had a pretty strong bladder, because he would sit there for hour after hour listening, and then when ZM was done with his monologue, he would say, that's very interesting, Mr. Prime Minister. If I understand what you're saying, it's X, Y, and Z. And then he would very subtly restate what, what ZM had just told him to basically put his own ideas across as if they were ZM's ideas. This is actually a pretty effective method of operating for whether, you know, in family life or business life, it's also pretty effective in advising foreign leaders. And by the way, he did it without speaking either French or Vietnamese, working through a translator, because Ed Lansdale had many talents, but language ability was not one of them. But having won ZM's confidence, he was then able to implement some of his ideas for how you strengthen the state of South Vietnam. Ideas, for example, such as what became known as Operation Passage to Freedom, moving nearly a million refugees from North Vietnam to South Vietnam in 1954, 1955, many of them Catholics, so thus greatly strengthening the state of South Vietnam and Lansdale convinced the U.S. Navy to provide ships, South Vietnam to provide facilities, and of course he used some of his patented PSYOPs magic uh, to convince people to leave North Vietnam for South Vietnam, including hiring a soothsayer uh, to predict bad fortune for North Vietnam and good fortune for South Vietnam. Another Ed Lansdale brainstorm was something that was known as Operation Brotherhood, 
which was bringing over Filipino nurses and doctors to provide free medical care to people in South Vietnam to win their allegiance to the government. And he did this through this ostensibly independent civic organization of the Philippines that, don't tell anybody, it was secretly funded by the CIA and, and started by Ed Lansdale. Now, not all of these initiatives were very popular with Lansdale's colleagues in the U.S. government, including his boss. And this was Lightning Joe Collins, a four-star general, one of the few U.S. generals who fought in both the Pacific and European theaters in World War II, former Army Chief of Staff, friend of General Eisenhower, who was appointed ambassador in Saigon and instantly clashed with Lansdale because General Collins had a very conventional war type of mindset and Lansdale had a very, as a former ad man, had a very unconventional mindset for dealing with these problems in South Vietnam. And at, at their very first country team meeting, Lightning Joe Collins made clear that he thought that the size of the South Vietnamese Army needed to be reduced because it was too expensive, whereas Ed Lansdale thought it should actually be increased because it was imperative to have the Army occupy these newly liberated areas in South Vietnam that were being evacuated by the Viet Minh. And it also had to grow because there were these various sect militias that had to be incorporated into the Army. Well, Lightning Joe Collins uh, was not used to uh, getting any disagreement from a mere colonel like Ed Lansdale, and he said, you know, I am the personal representative of the President of the United States, Mr. Sit down. The discussion is finished. And at that point, most colonels, when being lectured to by a four-star general, would sit down. But Ed Lansdale was kind of a born maverick, and so instead he stood up and said, well, sir, you may be the representative of the President of the United States, but I think if the people of the United States were to hear what you were, go what you were saying, they would have a different opinion. And I'm here to represent the views of the people of the United States. And then he walked out of the room. And amazingly enough, he kept his job after that shenanigan, which is a testament to uh, the strength of the support that he had from the Dulles brothers in Washington. And that support proved crucial during the most important episode of Lansdale's time in Vietnam, which was the 1955 Battle of Saigon, when No Den Diem sent his military to crush the sect militias from the Cao Dai, the Wa Ho, and the Bin Zuyen, uh, who together controlled arguably more armed fighters than the Army did. Uh, so with Lansdale's support, Ziem decided to, to crush these, these sect militias to assert the power of the state. While this battle was going on, Lightning Joe Collins was eager to ditch uh, Ziem and to withdraw U.S. support, which would have been fatal for him at that point. But uh, Ed Lansdale went behind his back, uh, went, went around straight to Alan Dulles and, and convinced President Eisenhower to override his own ambassador and to back Colonel Lansdale over General Collins. As a result of all that, General Collins wound up being relieved and Ed Lansdale and No Den Ziem appeared to be triumphant by 1956. Uh, Ziem was seen here touring the some of the newly pacified countryside with Ed Lansdale's encouragement. This was seen at the time as a huge Cold War success story, much like Lansdale's time in the Philippines. No Din Ziem got a ticker tape parade on Broadway. He was lauded by Life Magazine as the miracle man of Vietnam. And everybody in Washington who was in the know knew who was behind the miracle man's miracles, and that would be Ed Lansdale, who is here getting a declaration from Vice President Nixon as wife Helen looks on. So by this point, Ed Lansdale in the 1950s had an ever-growing reputation, not just within the secret circles of the government, but among the public as well, because he was publicly associated with the protagonist in The Quiet American, which was Graham Greene always denied, but he was definitely the model for one of the laudable characters in The Ugly American. So he was, he had a growing fame, which uh, the Kennedy brothers were very aware of when they took power in 1961. They th you know, Ed Lansdale was their kind of guy. They thought of him as the American James Bond, as the T. Lawrence of Asia, as the ugly American, as the quiet American, all these, all these uh, uh, names that attached to him. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it turned out that his outsized reputation would be his undoing. Why is that? Because the Kennedys had greater faith in, in, in Ed Lansdale's ability to be a miracle worker than anybody could possibly vindicate. They were obsessed with overthrowing Fidel Castro, especially after the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. And that really uh, undermined their faith in the CIA, which had been responsible for the Bay of Pigs. And so they wanted to get rid of Castro, but they didn't want to rely on the CIA. So who are they going to turn to to get rid of Fidel Castro? 
Well, they turn to the American James Bond, to the T. Lawrence of Asia, to the ugly American, to Ed Lansdale. And they gave him basically an impossible assignment as operations director of Project Mongoose, this post to which he was appointed at the end of 1961. He was essentially told to get rid of Castro, preferably within a year, but not to do it with American military force. And there was no way to overthrow Castro anytime soon without an American military invasion. Lansdale understood this, but he still tried to uh, give uh, the Kennedys, and especially Bobby Kennedy, who was overseeing this project personally, he wanted to give the Kennedys what they demanded. And so he and, and, and this interagency task force came up with all sorts of brainstorms, like uh, Gusano Libra, uh, Free Worm. This was a play on, on, the, on, on the derogatory insult that, uh, that Castro directed at his enemies, calling them worms. And so this was the CIA came up with this propaganda leaflet showing the free worm sabotaging power lines in Cuba. Pretty cute, probably one of the cuter mascots I've seen for any insurgency, but uh, it wasn't really effective. Uh, sadly, the only thing that Operation Mongoose achieved was it generated the intelligence, which allowed policymakers in Washington to figure out that uh, Nikita Khrushchev was placing nuclear missiles into Cuba. But after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in the fall of 1962, Operation Mongoose was disbanded and essentially Ed Lansdale's career at the Pentagon was over. At that point, he was a two-star general, and he was on his way out because having lost the favor of the Kennedys, having not delivered uh, Castro's head on a, on a plate like they wanted, he was essentially left defenseless before his bureaucratic enemies, of whom the most important was this man, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Now, McNamara and, and Lansdale were like oil and water. Uh, McNamara, of course, was came over to the Department of Defense from running the Ford Motor Company, Harvard Business School graduate, somebody who was enamored of numbers. Ed Lansdale had a very different outlook on the world and was not this academic superstar as, as McNamara had been. Their, one of their very first encounters occurred in, in, the, in early 1961 when Ed Lansdale, newly back from Vietnam, brought over this load of weapons, very simple weapons like pikes and rusty muskets caked with mud and blood and took them into, Lansdale, into McNamara's office and dumped them on McNamara's immaculate desk. And McNamara wanted to know who this guy was and why he was dirtying his desk. And uh, Lansdale explained, you know, Mr. Secretary, these are the weapons being used by our enemies in Vietnam. They're not very sophisticated. The people who are using them may not look like soldiers to you. They think of themselves as soldiers, they wear, but they wear black pajamas and they're fighting this army equipped and trained by the United States to be a mirror image of our own, but you know what? They're licking our, our army because they have the power of ideals. They have the power of an idea, and we need to counter their idea with our idea. We're never going to beat them just with firepower alone. Well, in hindsight, this was pretty good advice to be giving, but it wasn't something that McNamara was receptive to. He just concluded that, uh, that uh, Lansdale was an idiot who didn't understand his higher mathematics and ushered him out of the office. And so it was all downhill from there, which was, in, in retrospect, I would argue a historical tragedy because Lansdale was really sidelined from U.S. policy in Vietnam in 1963 as relations between ZM and Kennedy hit a new low because of the Buddhist crisis. You had these Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire. You had militant Buddhists protesting against the government and the ZM regime responding with growing repressiveness, which convinced the Kennedy administration that the only way to win the war against the communists was to overthrow ZM. Uh, now, this is something that Lansdale warned against all the time. He said, you know, there are problems with ZM. I know he's imperfect, but what we need to do is to sideline his conspiratorial brother, No Din Nu, who had gained a hold over ZM after Lansdale had left Vietnam, just sideline his brother let me go back to Vietnam and I'll work with them and try to guide him along the right path. But Lansdale's bureaucratic enemies prevented him from going there and the Kennedy administration did not listen to him. Even when he warned that supporting this military coup would be a disaster because the generals would be far more illegitimate and far more corrupt than ZM had ever been. They went ahead in the best and the brightest and the arrogance of their power. And so on November 1 of 1963, the very day that Ed Lansdale was being retired from the Pentagon, the coup uh, backed by the U.S. began in Saigon. And within a day, No Din Ziem was dead along with his brother, murdered by the military. The results were every bit as catastrophic as Lansdale had predicted because you had one military coup follow another. The leadership of South Vietnam changed constantly. Stability disintegrated. The, 
the uh, all of the all of the positive initiatives that uh, ZM had tried to implement to to fight the communists quickly were abandoned, and uh, the communists stepped up their infiltration of, of South Vietnam. And the inevitable result of that was by 1965, Lyndon Johnson decided he had no choice but to send American troops into combat to save South Vietnam. Now, this was the last thing that Ed Lansdale ever wanted. He never wanted to see half a million American troops in Vietnam thrashing through the jungles with their free fire zones and, and search and destroy missions. He wanted to support South Vietnam, but he wanted to do it with a small advisory presence focused on building up a viable, legitimate state in South Vietnam that could defend itself. And all of that was abandoned uh, as, the, as the big war uh, mentality took over. Now, Ed Lansdale went back to Vietnam in 1965 to try to do something to rescue a situation that he recognized even then was spinning out of control. Now he was a civilian working for the U.S. ambassador, Henry Cabot Lodge. And that was a very awkward relationship because, of course, Henry Cabot Lodge had been the ambassador who had overseen uh, the coup that had overthrown and killed Lansdale's friend, No Din Ziem. And he was this uh, very arrogant Brahmin from Boston who thought he had all the answers, even though he understood very little about Vietnamese society. And Lansdale's attempts to educate him were not very successful. Now, in the mid-60s, Lansdale did not have the same kind of political top cover that he had enjoyed in the mid-1950s because his greatest patron was Hubert Humphrey, the vice president. But anybody who knows anything about the Johnson administration knows that uh, Lyndon Johnson had very little regard for Hubert Humphrey and certainly was not going to listen to him on Vietnam. Uh, Lansdale also tried to cultivate this man, Win Cao Ki, who was the, this, uh, uh, this very flashy Air Force vice marshal who became prime minister and then eventually vice president of South Vietnam. But he lost out on a power struggle to other generals in the junta. And so essentially Ed Lansdale was sidelined and was not able to exert the kind of influence in the 60s that he had done a decade earlier. And he was really this helpless observer as the war was Americanized and uh, the casualties piled up on all sides. I mean, Ed Lansdale could see this was not going to work. He tried to explain to General Westmoreland that he was not going to kill his way out of this conflict, but Westmoreland was oblivious because he was convinced that he could kill the Viet Cong faster than they could be replaced. And, uh, you know, this was the great illusion that was shattered by the Tet Offensive, which began almost exactly 50 years ago today. And Ed Lansdale understood very quickly that uh, it was not a great victory for the United States. It was actually a huge psychological blow that would help the Viet Cong. He left Vietnam finally a few months after the Tet Offensive, dejected, defeated, and demoralized. And he was not very, he was not very surprised when in 1975, North Vietnam invaded and overran South Vietnam, which by then was the, was the husk of a state. The intriguing question to ask, and which I ask, of course, in my book title, The Road Not Taken, is could things have worked out differently? And of course, we'll never know. Uh, and I certainly can't promise you that if Ed Lansdowe had been listened to, we would have won the Vietnam War because North Vietnam would have been a very formidable adversary under any circumstances. I think one thing that we can say for certain, though, is that even if we had lost, it would not have been at such horrific cost. We would not have lost 58,000 Americans in the jungles of Vietnam and millions of Vietnamese in this terrible war because Lansdowe never wanted to see uh, this big unit war uh, to begin with. Now, in many ways, the book obviously is, does not have a happy ending, but there was a little bit of happiness for Ed Lansdale personally because after his first wife died, uh, Pat, Lansdale, Pat, Pat Kelly, uh, by that point retired from the U.S. Embassy in Manila, never remarried, moved out uh, to the United States. And on July 4th of 1973, she and uh, Ed Lansdale were married, and they lived happily ever after. Until, that's them, by the way, in, in Northern Virginia. And they lived happily ever after until Ed Lansdale's own death in 1987 from natural causes. And I have to say, it was a very moving experience for me to visit Ed Lansdale's grave at Arlington National Cemetery because I feel like I never met him, but I, I feel like I really knew him, and in some ways better uh, than his own children, and, and, and frankly, better than pro I probably know my own father. Uh, so I, it, this was really a, an interesting experience and moving experience for me the last five years uh, to be so closely uh, intertwined with the details of Ed Lansdale's life. And I've tried to tell that story in this book. I think it's an adventure story, a love story, a spy story. And I think it's also a story with, with some resonance for the present day. Because remember, we are today engaged in another massive counterinsurgency, this time not against communists, but against jihadists. 
And this is another war that we're not going to win with American combat troops. We're not going to send hundreds of thousands of American troops to occupy the Middle East. Done there, tried that, didn't work, not a happy experience, not going to do it again anytime soon. So if we're not going to win this war on, on uh, Islamism uh, with American combat troops, how are we going to win it if we win it? I think it'll be with American advisors. And those advisors could do a lot worse than to study the lessons of Ed Lansdale because he was one of the most extraordinary advisors of the 20th century, right up there with T. Lawrence. So I think he has much to teach us, some of it negative, some of it positive, but all those lessons I think are worth learning. And that's what I've tried to do with this book is, is to tell that story. So with that, uh, let me stop talking at you and then and hear your, your comments and questions. Thanks. It's, I'm uh, really going to enjoy this book uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. I'll ask you just one basic question about one of your major themes here. And I'll just quote a line from opening up. Lansdale's greatest gift was for establishing a rapport with foreigners, even if he did not speak their language. That's so rare these days. When I think of the Afghanistan and Iraq experience, I know of very few high-level relationships like that. I can only think of like McChrystal's relationship with Wardock, for example, in right. Afghanistan, but not many others. So uh, why do you think we're not good at that? Is it because we're institutionally structured to not sustain that with one and two year tours, whether you're intelligence or military or diplomats? Is it because the, U, uh, the State Department has been emasculated for so many decades for whatever reason you can, uh, you can propose? Or is it because Americans who are uh, good-hearted people are essentially goobers abroad. Well, I think uh, you not only asked a good question, I think you provided some pretty good answers to that question. Um, you know, I think it was very hard for Ed Lansdale. He really ran counter uh, to the kind of bureaucratic culture of the U.S. government, uh, which, whether in the 50s or 60s or today, is kind of oriented on bottom line results and tends to think of when we deal with with insurgents, let's go out and kill them. That's kind of the easiest bottom line answer, even though it can doesn't necessarily produce a, a long-term strategic success, uh, it briefs well. You can have PowerPoint slides and show everybody uh, all, the, all, the, uh, all the enemy troops you're killing, all the ground you're taking. That's what's impressive. And of course, we tend to rotate people through for very short tours. When we deal with foreign leaders, it's often with envoys coming from Washington to deliver these demarches and to say, our way or the highway. You're seeing kind of an example of that now where we're cutting off aid to Pakistan in frustration. Uh, so, you know, everything that Ed Lansdale did, basically trying to use empathy as, as a weapon of war, trying to understand the local society, which required years of immersing himself in local culture, trying to win the friendship of local people. All this kind of stuff is, there are some Americans who do it today, and, and I don't want to begrudge that. There are certainly some who do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the training for CIA case officers, among others, but it's not a general MO for the U.S. government. We don't, we don't cultivate people like Ed Lansdale because we don't think what they do is very valuable. Uh, and we, you know, we tend to be much more cut and dried and technologically focused on our approach. And what we don't under, we, we just, I, you know, one of, the, one of the profound things that, you know, Ed Lansdale said is that I fear that Americans will never learn the simplicity of fighting a political war, and I think that's still true today, that we still fight, to this day, technological wars and not political wars, and that's often why we don't achieve the results that, that we seek to achieve. Sir. Um, thank you for your explanation of uh, Ed Lansdale, and, and both tonight and with your book. I'm wondering. There only there seems like one thing that you explained seemed like a mistake that he made, and I'm wondering whether you agree or disagree. But uh, I'm stumped as to why, given his background, he didn't speak what I guess he might have thought was the truth to the Kennedys when he was first asked to deal with. Castro, because it seemed like it was an undoable thing. It wasn't the Philippines. It was a different thing. And if indeed they accepted being told off, then he might have had more standing with them. Quite possibly, but it's, it's hard to say no to the President of the United States. And that was something that Ed Lansdale subsequently regretted. I mean, he, he regretted that he ever became involved uh, in this whole Cuba thing, and he certainly regretted 
the way it went. And you're right. I mean, this was this was one of the paradoxes of his career because when he came to Vietnam, he was kind of this fearless truth teller who, as I mentioned, was not afraid to stand up to a four-star ambassador, and he certainly stood up to a Secretary of Defense and many others, basically telling them that they were wrong. But in the case of Cuba, uh, you know, his conviction failed him, and you know there were a variety of reasons for that. And I mean, some of it was he was he did not have a giant ego, but you know, everybody has a little bit of an ego, and so when the president and his brother say that they're depending on you and and they take you into their confidence, it's very hard to say what you're asking me to do can't be done. You you you, you want to get it done. And he thought that if he did for them what, what they wanted, which is to overthrow Castro, they would do for him what he wanted, which was to get a return ticket back to Saigon. Uh, and, and obviously that, that led to this, uh, uh, to this great disaster of, of that, was no, that was Operation Mongoose. Thank you. Yeah. So th this is the same question in a way, in a, a slightly different angle. Did the Army take anything from this, or our military? Um, I mean, supposedly they studied Vietnam. I mean, they obviously didn't want it to happen again. Right. Um, but did they learn anything? Um, can you, can, would he have been able to deal with somebody like Maliki or Karzai? Um, and can we manage in a situation where we're supporting unpopular leaders? Well, that's a great question. And there has been some attempt to learn from him. I mean, for example, uh, you know, in, in 2006, right before he went over to Iraq, uh, General Petraeus and General Mattis produced the Army Marine Field Manual on counterinsurgency. They didn't actually cite Lansdale in there in part because he hasn't written it. He didn't write anything that was influential, but I know just from talking to General Lansdale, and he and I did an event together about this book last week in New York, he was certainly, uh, Petraeus was, was very familiar with Lansdale, and, and that was part of his inspiration. Um, so I think there has been an attempt to learn some lessons, and in particular, I think, you know, some of the things in the Army Marine Field Manual on counterinsurgency are, you know, straight out of the Lansdale 101 playbook, uh, this notion that, uh, that it's a mistake to use too much force, that you should carefully calibrate your force uh, so that you don't make more enemies than you eliminate, that you should embrace the people, you should use civic action. These are all kind of landmarks of Lansdaleism that that are now, I think, more generally accepted and that were much more innovative when Lansdale was, was propounding these ideas in the 1950s. But I think we still fall short of the Lansdale mark. And I think there's still a tendency even today to think that we can kill our way out of, this, out of this insurgency. For example, now we rely so much on drone strikes and special operations raids. And you know, we've killed hundreds of thousands of jihadists since 9-11, but guess what? At the end of the day, there's probably more jihadists now than there were in in, in 2001. So that approach is not actually working. And why isn't it working? Because the politics of all these countries is still a mess. I mean, if you look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, pick a country, it's a mess. And until those places have more stable, legitimate government that can win the support of the people, they're not going to be successful. And part of our shortcoming in that regard has been in the way we've dealt with local leaders. And you mentioned Karzai in Afghanistan and Maliki in Iraq, and those are classic examples because those are, again, examples similar to the, to the fiasco with no Din Ziem, where we, we become alienated from our own local allies. We become at odds with them, and we start making demands on them, and they start pushing back, and you very quickly get into this dysfunctional relationship. And one, I think one of the problems there is that we didn't have anybody like Ed Lansdale who would get close to a Maliki or to a Karzai and to influence them in a constructive direction, avoiding these these destructive confrontations and I think that's that's been a huge missed opportunity and you know today I think the one of the most positive things the army has done they're setting up these new security assistance force brigades that are actually focused on training and deploying advisors which they've never done before that's always been kind of a bastard specialty within the military so I think that's a positive thing but uh, my question is you know okay it's great that we have military advisors but where are the political advisors? The because Department. it's really the political line of operations which is going to be decisive, and we don't have that. That's just not our focus, and that's, I think that's, that's, that demonstrates that there is still a failure to learn uh, from the lessons of Ed Lansdale. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Uh, could you say that, uh, that Russia has followed Lansdale's playbook in Syria, and uh, what are the prospects for the United States? Have we learned from Obama's mistake in that regard from what you perceive as emerging policy in the Pentagon and approaching that area? Well, that's an intriguing question. Um, 
has Russia learned from the Lansdale playbook? Well, I mean, they certainly have an effective local political ally, uh, however repugnant, in Bashar Assad, and they've, they have supported him to the hilt. Uh, they are certainly not learning from the Lansdale playbook of trying to create a more legitimate and representative government. They're just mm -hmm. operating on brute force. That's kind of the mm -hmm. Soviet slash Russian doctrine of counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. uh, which they're able to do with some success uh, in some places, not everywhere, with some success, uh, because they're willing to be so much more brutal uh, than, than we or any other liberal democracy can be. Now, I should add that that pure brutality can backfire too, as it did for the Russians in Afghanistan in the 1980s, where they killed something like a million people and still lost the war. Uh, but there's no question that with Iranian help in, in Syria, they are being very effective in consolidating Assad's authority, even though he long ago lost any moral legitimacy to rule anybody other than the uh, minority Alawite population. In our case, um, you know, I think I would have still have to give us an incomplete grade because it's unclear what's going to happen. I think we've certainly done a pretty good job on the military front in uh, inflicting some, some tactical defeats on ISIS. But I think the question that we have to face now is how lasting are those defeats going to be? Because, you know, I remember back in 2006, 2007, 2008, when we also inflicted a defeat on al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was the predecessor organization to ISIS, and then the politics of, of Iraq and Syria went to hell in a handbasket, and then you had basically AQI 2.0, which was ISIS arising, and I think it's very possible that a few years from now, unless the politics of places like Iraq and Syria shakes out in a more constructive direction, that you could see an ISIS 3.0 down the line. And that's really uh, our weakness. We're not very focused on the politics, which admittedly is very hard to influence because it is another country, but unless we can somehow nudge those polit the political direction in a, in, in, in a better way, uh, as long as Sunnis in Syria and Iraq continue to feel disenfranchised and victimized by these Iranian-backed, Shiite-dominated regimes, that resentment will, will bubble over in support for extremist groups like ISIS. So mm -hmm. I am, you know, skeptical about how lasting our, our current so-called victory in, against ISIS will actually be. Yeah, and if Pakistan is any indication, that even puts up bigger nail in that coffin. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. again, uh, we've struggled in, in Afghanistan because we've struggled to, to support a legitimate government that doesn't victimize its own people. And, and too often, uh, a lot of what the Afghan government does drives more people into the arms of the Taliban, who, of course, have the support of Pakistan. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very problematic conflict as well. Sir? What would have been Lansdale's take on Ho Chi Minh and sort of what his appeal was in South Vietnam. Did, did Lansdale see Ho Chi Minh as sort of a, 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 a pawn of Moscow, or did he understand any type of nationalist appeal he had? Uh, how, did, how, did he see, how did he see Ho Chi Minh? I think it's fair to say that Lansdale saw Ho Chi Minh as both a communist and a nationalist. And I think he was, he certainly saw him, you know, as a tool of Moscow and Beijing, uh, you know, I think probably more than was warranted by, by, by the facts as we know them in hindsight. But he was also keenly aware of Ho Chi Minh's genuine nationalist and political appeal as the guy who had defeated the French colonialists. And he really wanted to build up uh, No Din Ziem as a counterweight to that. And there, because remember that there was a genuine non-communist nationalist movement in, in Vietnam that, that uh, Ho Chi Minh tried to repress. Uh, you know, it's, it's not accurate to say that he was only a communist. He was also a nationalist. But it's also not accurate to say that he was the only embodiment of Vietnamese nationalism. As a lot of historians working on Vietnam today will say that there was really a, a civil war over the future of Vietnamese nationalism between uh, the communists in the North and the non-communist factions in the South, and in both cases backed by outside sponsors, China and, and the Soviet Union in the North, the United States in the South. And, you know, Lansdale believed that uh, winning the, the ideological struggle was going to be more important than winning uh, the tactical struggle on the ground. And he believed it was imperative not only to build up uh, the, the leaders of South Vietnam as legitimate representatives of, of, of the people of South Vietnam, which was very hard to do when you were dealing with somebody like ZM who was moving in a more autocratic direction or then the generals who had completely had no legitimacy whatsoever. He also wanted to do more to undermine uh, Ho Chi Minh, you know, publicizing, for example, the purges that he undertook in the mid-1980s 
1950s, which killed tens of thousands of Vietnamese, and to try to, you know, puncture his image as being this, uh, this, uh, uh, this wise and beneficent representative of Vietnamese nationalism. And in both regards, it's pretty obvious in, that he that he fell short of his objectives. All right, thanks. So we can take the one final question over here. Yep. Uh, so I'm curious, how did America's image and values influence the le the local leaders who Lansdale was trying to cultivate? And also, was it easier for Lansdale to get local leaders to work and trust him when if they could tell that he had the confidence and support of the top foreign policy officials in the U.S. government? Yes, absolutely. It made a huge difference to, to Lansdale to have the kind of support that he had from Dulles, from the Dulles brothers and President Eisenhower in the 1950s. That made him a man who was very much listened to uh, in, in Saigon and in, and in Manila. And uh, on the other hand, by the mid-60s, as he no longer had that kind of top-level support in, in Washington, that was you know, pretty obvious in Saigon, that the, the South Vietnamese political class, they were pretty astute leader, readers of, of the political tea leaves, and they understood that this guy did not have the kind of pull that he had had in, in, in olden times, and that certainly affected his ability to to be as effective as he had been in the past. And, you know, to answer the other part of your question, I think, you know, the reputation of the United States was was in many ways Lansdale's uh, most important weapon because that was really what he relied upon. He really, as I mentioned before, he was really enamored of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and those were the ideals that he preached, and he constantly told people in places like the Philippines and Vietnam that we were not there as, 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 as colonialists. Uh, to, to coin a phrase, uh, we did not put America first. Uh, we were there to defend the local people and to work with them instead of imposing control from Washington. And of course, people were suspicious of that because they had experience, for example, dealing with French colonialists and, and they thought and they were afraid that we would be in the same mold. And I think, you know, Lansdale managed to break out of that perception for at least a few years, largely through his personal relationships with people like Mog Tsai Tsai and NZM and other leaders uh, because they understood that uh, he was a different kind of American. He was not he was not this ugly, swaggering American. He was actually an empathetic listener. But I think, you know, by the by the nineteen sixties that, that reputation had faded and we were much more into a into a mindset of trying to dictate uh, to those societies as we did, for example, by by backing the military coup against DM C M and, you know, relying on massive firepower which killed vast numbers of people who might otherwise have been sympathetic to our side. So sadly, the Lansdale approach was implemented for a few years and then fell by the wayside with, uh, with tragic historical consequences. Thank you. Thank you once again.